Now, we've seen that normal subgroups are the key ingredient in forming quotient groups. Because of that, we're interested in rules that let us detect normal subgroups. For here, we start with a special case of the index 2 theorem. Then we'll show some examples, and we'll identify a special class of examples called the dihedral group. First, the index 2 theorem. So we'll have H, a subgroup of some group G. If the index of the subgroup H and G is equal to 2, so that means we have two cosets, either two left cosets or two right cosets, then H is automatically a normal subgroup of G. Now recall, for H to be a normal subgroup of G, just says, if we take a left coset, that's equal to its corresponding right coset. So I can just push the X to the other side, and that holds for any X in G. Now, for the proof, break it into two cases. First, if X is in our subgroup H, that X times H is equal to H, H times X is equal to H, and our statement holds. For the second case, we'll have that X is not in H. Now recall, H itself is a coset, in this case a left coset, if we let X be equal to the identity. So here we have two cosets. One contains an element that's not in the other, so that means these two cosets are disjoint. Now, we only have two cosets, so there's only two partitions I can consider. If we partition by left cosets, we have H and then everything that's not in H. So that'll be X times H. On the other hand, if we partition by right cosets, we have H and everything that's not H. Since we're looking at right cosets, we'll have H times X. So that means x times h has to be equal to h times x, and that's the index 2 theorem. Now, recall we could put a group structure on the space of cosets. Here it's not going to be very interesting. So what happens is, okay, we're going to put a group multiplication on the cosets. So we have a two element group. Now, in essence, there's only one two-element group. What happens there? We have the identity element. In this case, it's going to be the subgroup H. And then the other element is going to have order two. Now, I haven't shown that before, so let's just go through that argument in this case. So this says if we multiply XH by itself, we're going to get the identity element. So if we have a two-element group, if I multiply XH by XH, we have two possibilities. We get either H or XH. If we get back XH, we can cancel on both sides to get the XH is equal to H, the identity element. That's a contradiction because we're insisting that XH not be the identity element. So that means XH squared is equal to the identity or XH has order two. Now, we should only consider non-abelian examples. If we're working in an abelian group, then all of its subgroups are normal, and we don't need the index 2 theorem. First, we have our familiar example, S3, symmetries of equilateral triangle, labeled 1, 2, 3 at the vertices. We take the rotation subgroup, so it has three elements. The index is 2, okay, so we have H and 1, 2 H. And recall the way we interpret our cosets are recording whether the elements carry the top to the top, bottom to the bottom, or whether they interchange the two. Another example, I'll consider S4, the symmetries of a regular tetrahedron. So this has 24 elements. We have the subgroup A4, which consists of the rigid motions. So here we have no reflections in the group. Now, A4 has 12 elements. So the index of A4 and S4 is going to be 2, which means A4 is a normal subgroup. And for the quotient group, the way the cosets collect the elements for the identity coset, same idea as with the triangle. 
the identity coset elements are going to carry the inside to the inside, the outside of the tetrahedron to the outside. For the other coset, those elements turn the tetrahedron inside out. Next example, so with this example, we're going to leave the index 2 theorem behind, and then I'll spend the rest of the talk taking a look at things that happen in here. We have the dihedral group with 2n elements. So we label that D2n. Okay, sometimes you see that written D sub n. And that's just about identifying the number of vertices that we have. So dihedral group with 2n elements is going to be the group of symmetries of an n-sided regular polygon. So we've already seen some special examples of this. For S3, that's the same as D6, so our three gons a triangle. For a four gon, we have the symmetries of the square, and we've already seen D sub 8. In general, okay, the symmetries of a regular n-sided polygon has two n elements. So to see that, what we do is, okay, so I have a hexagon here, but we could use any regular polygon. How many choices do we have to send one to as a vertex? Well, we can send that to any of these six vertices, so we'll have n in general. Once I decide where one goes, I have two choices. Okay, I could either keep things oriented this way, or we can flip. So that means we'll have n times two elements. Now, what kind of elements show up in d sub 2n? First, we have the rotations. So, to determine a rotation, all I need to do is tell you where I send one, and then we just rotate till we get one to where it's going and everyone else follows. So that means we'll have n rotations if we include the identity in there. That's going to give us a subgroup. Note, if I have n rotations as a subgroup, the rotation subgroup has index 2 and d2n. Okay, we have 2n here, we have n here, we divide, we get 2. So the rotations are going to be a normal subgroup in our dihedral group. The remaining elements are all going to be reflections. So in this case, how do we get reflections? Well, there are going to be two types. Either our axis of reflection is going to be through two opposing vertices, or the axis of reflection is going to be through two opposing edges. If n is odd, it's always going to be a vertex and an opposing edge. Now, the reflections are all of order two. Okay, for the order of the elements and the rotations, that's going to depend on what n you're using. Now, one thing we want to talk about, the different ways to present the dihedral groups. So our first way is just by using our labeling. So we can think of the dihedral groups just being subgroups of Sn generated by, okay, so here we're going to have an n cycle representing a rotation, and then all the elements that it generates. And then we'll also have a two cycle, which I always use as reflection through this horizontal line if I put one on that line. So if we think of the complex numbers, that's going to be our complex conjugation. Now, instead of considering D2n as a subgroup of a symmetric group, we can instead visualize D2n as symmetries of the complex plane. So we'll take a regular n-gon, we'll put center at zero in the complex plane, and I'll put one on the positive real axis. Then the rotation that carries one to two can be realized as just multiplication of complex numbers by e to the two pi over n. Now, if we multiply that number by itself n times, we get 1. So the order of this element r is going to be equal to n. Then for the element of order 2, we have complex conjugation. So it's just reflection in the real axis. Now, an interesting relation between r and c, if we conjugate r by c, so c r c inverse, we get r inverse. So the way we interpret this, if we reflect in the x-axis, rotate, and then flip again, it's just rotation in the other direction. 
So let's verify this using this idea of symmetries of the complex plane. So we have CRC inverse. Now C is of order two, so C inverse is equal to C. So I take element of the complex plane, which I'll we'll call Z. First thing I do is take its complex conjugate. Then if I apply R, we're just multiplying by E to the two pi I over N. I apply C again, which means take the complex conjugate of this product. If we take the complex conjugate of each term, I get E to the minus two pi I over N, and then the Z bar becomes Z. Now, note here, R is multiplication by E to the two pi I over N, so R inverse is E to the minus two pi I over N. So we have our R inverse here, and that verifies our identity. Now, these three items are enough to completely describe our dihedral group. So, this is what we would call a presentation by generators and relations. So, we have two generators, okay, our rotation generator and complex conjugation, R and C. The relations, okay, we have the two relations that tell us the order of the element, and then we have our relation that tells us how to multiply C and R together. Okay, note for our interesting relation, this is the same as saying if I have C times R and I want to switch the order, the R turns into an R inverse. Now, this is going to completely describe D2N. Okay, note the elements of D2N if we're using this notation. The rotations are just R to a power, and then the reflections are going to be complex conjugation C times R to some power. So that's a result from linear algebra. Every reflection through the origin can be written as a flip through the real axis and a rotation multiplied together. As an application of this notation, let's find the center of D2n. Recall, center of D2n is a set of all x in D2n that commute with every other element in the group. Now, as we calculate, Think about how things would go if we were using the notation from the symmetric group. So there's a real advantage to knowing how to write things like this. Now, let's start with the reflections. So we'll let x be equal to c times r of the k. And we'll see what happens if we try to commute with a rotation. So we'll take a rotation, g equal to r to the l. We're going to multiply g times x, x times g, set them equal. So G times X, we have R of the L, C, R of the K. If I want to switch the C and the R to the L, well, every time I push an R past the C, it picks up a minus sign. So we have C, R of the minus L, R of the K. So we have C, R of the K minus L. For X times G, we have C, R of the K, R of the L, which is just C, R of the K plus L. We set equal. Because we're in a group, we can cancel. So the C's go away and the R of the K's go away. So I have R of the L equals R of the minus L. Pushing everything to one side says R of the 2L is equal to E. Now note, the L here is arbitrary. We have to have this happen for all rotations. So that means R of the 2L is equal to E for all L. If we bring the 2 to the outside, that says that every rotation is of order 2. Now, if I'm working with okay, a three-gon, a triangle, or something with more vertices, that doesn't happen. So we'll never have a reflection in the center here. How about a rotation? Say x equal to r of the k. It's clear that x commutes with every other rotation. So we need only check against reflections. So let's pick one, g equal to c times r of the l. We compute g times x, x times g, set equal. When I cancel on both sides, move everything to one side, we get r of the 2k is equal to e. Now this is different from the previous equation we had. In the previous equation, the L was arbitrary, but here the k shows up in the element we're checking. So that's what we're solving for. So I have the equation r of the 2k is equal to e. Now we know r is of order n, so if n is equal to 2k, then we're going 
halfway around for this element in the center. So it's going to be rotation by 180 degrees. If n is odd, we're never going to be able to solve r of the 2k equal to e unless we're considering the identity element. So our answer is the center of d2n is the identity if n is odd, if n is even, okay, equal to 2k, then we have the identity and rotation by 180 degrees. Now, see what's missing when n is odd? Here we can consider the pentagon. Note, if we rotate by 180 degrees, the pentagon doesn't go back to itself, so that's not a symmetry. We have one more way to present dihedral groups. So this will work if you know linear algebra. So we can consider each of these symmetries of the complex plane as linear transformations on R2. So we choose a standard basis. I can write every rotation in this form. We can write complex conjugation in this form. So this says fix the x-axis, flip the y-axis. And if I want to find our reflections, we just multiply this matrix against any of these matrices, so as so. Now you'll note, when we have n equal to 2k, if I want that element that's in the center, when you calculate here, you're going to note you're just going to get minus the identity. Okay, And as a matrix, that certainly commutes with everything.